So thank you, Gorkin, for being here with us today. Um, some of the people here saw meteors, others didn't see, but we are going to screen some excerpts. Um, you are Turkish, uh, you have, you made film school there. Can you talk a little bit about your uh, biography uh, background to give background? <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> I um, I'm from Izmir, which is an Aegean city in in Turkey. It's it's looking at Greece. It's 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 called Simirna. It's a half Greek city. So I studied cinema there. But at that time, I studied uh, during the nineties, and uh, the, in the nineties, uh, the film was the only format and. There was not so many films being made at that time. Now there's this explosion of art of cinema, so everybody could work in the films. But at that time, we couldn't find a director to work. Later I did, but at that time, uh, when I graduated, um, I directly uh, went to uh, commercials and music videos because they were shooting on film format. So I want to know about the film stock, about the lenses they use. I, I, I want to learn how to use a film camera, actually, which I did in six months after I started working. Um, even though I, I, I was coming from a school which they were, uh, for them, uh, working for commercials, it was the worst thing, worst thing, you know? It was horrible for all of our teachers, and uh, but it was the only way, so. Uh, and I did, and I, I learned a lot from that. Uh, not only I learned uh, the film camera technically, I also learned how to shoot a landscape, how to shoot uh, a person, and how you, you know, light someone with particular film stock. So, and, uh, uh, and it, then afterwards in the future, I, I, I use a lot of uh, elements which I learned from that period. So after I studied, I moved to Istanbul and I, um, I shot commercials and music videos for, for a long time, almost a decade. Then I, uh, I became depressed uh, and uh, then I quit everything and I started making shorts and medium length films and at the end I made my first feature film. Why, why you were depressed by making commercials and vi music videos? Because even though if you do something very beautiful, uh, you, you sense that it's not going to last. That's the nature of it. So, I mean, I mean whenever a uh, director or producer is talking about the work they've done in commercials or you know, this popular uh, format uh, stuff, some, most of the time they talk bullshit because it's not going to last, it's going to disappear. For instance, it's going to disappear from TV, it's going to disappear from the internet because it's a con consuming culture. You may think that you shot, you made beautiful images, but the medium you work with, it's not, uh, you know, it's, 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 not, it's, it's an open relationship, I must say. So it's, it's, it's all one-way relationship. So that, that what makes it uh, makes me depressed because uh, I was make, doing it for the money and, and I was uh, for learning process. So when, when that uh, period is over, uh, I took risks and I, I go back uh, to the place I want, you know. So it, it was a kind of a gap for me because um, my family was not so wealthy. So I, have to, I had to work, yeah. so I couldn't go and do my first feature film in, uh, when I was uh, 25. So I go and, um, you know, uh, I also had a, which I, as I get older, I, I believe in the importance of that. I want to hang out with the, the film director and I want to find out how you construct a film. How you, how, what, what are all these process, all these, uh, banal uh, aspects of the of the film set you know mm -hmm. so i want to find out about that and um, then um, you know yeah 
Yeah. Uh, well, um, the um, Meteors, which is, um, I think, the most known film, it's your first, first feature, is a combination of several uh, genres or s several types, documentary, fiction, experimental. Um, even in documentary, you have different kinds of things, uh, found footage or uh, <laughs> footage that you filmed. Can you talk a little bit about how the process of creating Meteors um, was done? There are, there are a couple of things clash within each other, actually. First of all, um, um, I was, I was a bit, I was a bit too angry towards um, you know common art house cinema where you could follow cliches, you know, especially where I'm coming from, that uh, you had a couple of famous authors and the rest of the people are copying them. So everybody has this agenda or cl cliche enabled to you know, uh, create their first or second film. So I didn't want to follow that. I, uh, I decided to m do something uh, very punk rock. I mean, very raw. I want to work with the raw materials. Not only I shot on HD, I also use images from people's iPads or, or uh, some mobile phone images and mix them technically in a way and we had a lot of work in the post-production but the idea actually came uh, from that reaction towards uh, regular arts art house cinema um, um, there were there was something happening in my country which um, the cinema itself was in the not in the is not in touch with each other with the social life or uh, Politically, I must say. So I, this is how I decided to do that film. But at the same time, there is one important thing happened, that uh, my mother passed away, and I was at home very, you know, I was in a very bad mood, and I started to watch uh, some uh, web streams from the internet. It was coming from the southeast of Turkey, and uh, and Turkish army were, uh, was attacking people's houses there. Uh, they were calling them terrorists, so unable to kill them, they were uh, ruining the whole neighborhoods and blocks and some parts of the city, cities like Diyarbakir, for instance. So I was, I was watching that, and then uh, at first I want to do something uh, like James Benning, a one-shot, one-hour film, mm -hmm. but the camera doesn't move, but the people comes and goes and stuff like that, but then uh, I see that these people are doing, what they do is actually cinema, but they don't know it's, it's cinema. I mean, uh, I was looking at these images for like 20 minutes or 10 minutes, and, and then magic was happening. So the idea actually came from that. And um, um, because I, I don't consider myself as a purist documentary, I don't believe in purist documentary filmmaking. If, um, because the, the, it, it, a kind of thing, such thing doesn't exist. The whole thing also, I mean, when you do a documentary, you approach it like a fiction film. You construct it, you write, you edit, you try, you experiment. So um, I want to make a different kind of documentary film. Uh, even though the audience or person who watches it have no idea about what's going on in the film. Uh, that person could have a relationship with the images uh, which they see. So I want to make a film about, so I, I, don't, I try not to analyze too much that part, but I mostly analyze the part how I'm gonna do it physically. So that was the most difficult part, I guess, within Meteors. Um, this conversation is interactive, so if someone wants to make a question, please just say. Um, one of the things that surprised me on Meteors was that at the time, 2015, 15. 15, uh, and, and now, even now, we see a lot of war films. Um, and I think your film, it's a war film, but at the same time, it's not. So this mix of 
uh, war with things that are not war seems to bring together in your film. Um, what's your relation to this idea of war film? Can you speak a little bit about that? Actually, idea came from one sentence. I was uh, I wrote uh, somewhere that the nature is war and war is nature, and uh, these these two things has a relationship within each other. So I, I don't. Uh, it's interesting you said that I don't consider myself as a war film, but mm -hmm. it's about war, mm -hmm. you know. But not only war between classes and the, and the powerful and the weak or powerful and minority, but also the war within the nature itself. So that's why I started to hanging out with the hunters at the Southeast, because they were hunting these really beautiful, rare uh, goat creatures. And it, it, it's, it was illegal back then. But then again, killing people also illegal in Turkey, but, uh, but the state was doing it. Yeah. So, the, these, uh, the idea came from that because um, uh, the thing about the goats, uh, you can only hunt them during the summers because in summers they came down. Uh, this is how hunters captured them. It's the same goes with the Kurdish guerrilla. Uh, they are really successful hiding themselves at the top of the mountains, which is the border of uh, Turkish border in the southeast. But they only come out in the in the summertime, which Turkish army could see them, and actually, you know, this is how they could attack them. So there's this similarity between guerrilla and, and this really archetype creature, mm -hmm. and and they were all coming from the same uh, geography, and then. And I didn't want to show uh, some guerrilla struggling with Turkish army, and. Um, I want to show in a way that people cr could create their own narratives, even though they have no idea about the contemporary politics. So the uh, idea came from that, to gluing all these ideas together. And uh, because film methods is basically suggesting that there is this war uh, created by this, this state and then Pagan gods intervene and they throw some rocks and able to stop the war. So there, is, there was this uh, supernatural aspect also mm -hmm. because this area, uh, psychogeographically, this area also was the home of uh, Pagan beliefs in the past, uh, pre-Islam period, I mean. Also Kurdish minority, uh, even though you know, they believe in Islam, but mostly they are very secular, secular uh, community. And um, if you look at with the relation between men and women, also the, uh, you know, family structure. So the idea of paganism came from that too, because, uh, because once one of state officials called, called them, you are not Muslims, you are pagans. And this is exactly that. And, uh, and uh, their gods uh, came to rescue. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it's good now to, to see the goat scene that we chose? Yeah, yeah, let's check it, check it. So just to clarify, we are seeing the, we are seeing the prologue of the film that we are. It's a it's a prologue called Hunters. Uh, these hunter these hunters helping rich wealthy people uh, with with a great amount of money to killing these goats, and and and, and a couple of mountains away the, there are Turkish army and Kurdish guerrilla killing each other also. It's, this is, you should know about the geography.
when I see this part, I, I, I know that you don't want to overanalyze, but uh, when I see this part, I was thinking that you are shooting this like it was a, it, it is a gun, like a, a camera that is also a gun. Like it, if it was a war film, this part. Yeah, it's also, yeah. Yeah. Um, when I try to uh, construct a film or try to construct the idea about a film, you know, I'm, uh, I'm trying to not to plan everything. Uh, I believe in accidents. Okay. I believe in coincidences. Um, for instance, this sequence completely come out of um, ex an accident because I was shooting at the city while people were, you know, uh, with the guns, they were fighting each other. And then there were one of the policemen, secret police, he actually saw me and said, okay, you are here again. I'm not going to warn you. And they put me and take me out of the, you know, with the police car, with the cameraman. And then I met with one of the hunters there, and he's saying, "Okay, why don't? Why are you shooting this? Come and shoot us!" And you know, <laughs> because he was. Uh... Then I said, "Okay, okay, I'm coming with you. I, I cannot go back to the city anyway. So maybe it's maybe I could hang out with you in the mountain a couple of days, and uh, because it took four or five days to capture the, these animals. So then I." started to construct the idea uh, that there is a similarity between guerrilla and these uh, beautiful animals. And, um, um, and I want to open the film with this sequence because uh, it's completely, it takes the, your orient orientation as an audience and people may say, okay, what's going on in here? And, uh, uh, but then I decided to go back to the uh, goats at the end again. So all these decision came, decisions came naturally because of um, I, I, I don't like to make films uh, when things are too planned, too stylized, too this and that. There, there's a lot of shots in this sequence they actually look really bad, you know. But what we try to do to make them, because as, a, as I told you at the beginning, that I was shooting a lot of commercial stuff. So I have to work with 4Ks and all these polished images and this and that. So I was, you know, had enough with that. So I kind of, uh, even though these um, images uh, may look uh, weak, technically, uh, it has their own, you know, spirit, which I call... Uh, I like to call cinema, and um, yeah, this is what we um, try to do with this film. Um, again, it's op uh, when you th think about the film, you could uh, made an adaptation from a book or a poem or some. You could inspire by a painting, whatever. Uh, it has to come from you. I mean, it has to come something really personal. Uh, I remember uh, when I was pitching this film with the producer friends of mine in Istanbul, they were, they were literally running away. They were lit running away from the steps and I never saw them again. Because they said, okay, this idea, what, what, what kind of movies you are making? And um, then I decided to not to work with any producers and so I do it alone and the producers came later. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that you may have an idea which may sound extremely ridiculous on paper or when you talk about it and uh, there will be many people will tell you that, okay, this film, there is no idea there, to, enough idea to make a film, which I mostly disagree. You, because cinema is an extremely powerful tool and also it could be quite personal I mean, look at this camera. This, with the, with the, you know, you could make a really, you know, high-resolution film with a really, you know, yeah. simple, uh, you know, tools. So it's not, it's not difficult as much as in the past. So uh, uh, whenever something is too stylized or a copy of copy of something, that uh, that. Uh, 
that is the place where honesty dies, if I'm, you know. So most of the time I'm making these decisions, uh, you know. I don't know why I made yeah. these decisions. And uh, it's better to live like that. Uh, what most important thing is to have a relationship with the audience. And uh, if, you're, uh, if you're pushing their taste, if you, if you create this uh, psychology or psychogeography within a film that they could get lo lost into, then, uh, yeah, then you've done a good job as a director or a filmmaker. And, um, and, and all, most of the ideas uh, with Meteors didn't work on paper at all. So I have no text. I write the texts later uh, during the editing. Then, so uh, we were uh, editing at the same time, and I was seeing that, okay, these shots are you know, is useless. So let's go back and shoot a little bit more. It was not productive, and it was a bit too expensive, but it worked at the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some questions? I always vote for Kurdish party. So it's, it's, a, it's a movement which I'm really, uh, I have close relationship with. And not actively, you know, I'm not a member of any party or anything. But I always uh, vote for the Kurdish party because I want them in the parliament. Because the most smart ones are always coming from the Kurdish parties, both men and women, it doesn't matter. They are very open-minded, not only politically, you know, they are really, you know, strong, but they are also really open-minded and they care about the other in the country. So my uh, close relationship comes from that. Uh, there is another reason. Um, I'm coming from Izmir, which you call the, uh, you know, white Turkish people comes. It's, it's the most secular city in Turkey. It's, a, it's a, you know, well-educated people there. And uh, you don't expect uh, some uh, person from Izmir could make this kind of film about Kurdish uh, community. And I don't agree with that. I mean, if you're, fi if you're a filmmaker, you could do anything you want. You don't need to have this kind of identity in able to, you know. I mean, I could come over to Porto and make a film if I want to. Or you could come over to Izmir and make a film if you, you know, if you feel like. So all these attachments comes from uh, uh, the dream you are seeing in your head, actually. And uh, I don't consider myself as an activist. Activism or video activism is a different kind of concept. I consider myself as a filmmaker. I saw that, I mean, at that time, now it's changed after Meteors, but at that time, nobody was in the interested in making a film about this issue. Because, um, uh, because first, they don't care. Second, uh, they, were, they were scared. And uh, it was ridiculously dangerous to go there at that time. So, um, so you don't need some kind of, you know, real life attachment in able to do these kind of projects. You just, um, as I told you earlier, that at that time, uh, we we don't even know how many people got killed in the region. At that time, there was a media blackout. And at the same time, my mother passed away, and we were in pain, the whole family. So I was trying to imagine what these people were feeling. And um, there was one case, uh, there was this family hiding in their home, and their uh, little girl got killed by a sniper. But they couldn't collect the body for two days from the streets. And at the end, when, when they did, they had to put her in a fridge because they were not allowed to go to hospital 
or a more, I must say. So watching all these stuff makes me extremely ang angry as, as a human being, not as a filmmaker or this and that, but as a human being, it makes me really angry and, and uh, that's why I make this film without any belonging or family connection with the, with the region. Mm -hmm. You were telling me that this film was not screened in Turkey yet. Yes. yet. yes. Can you explain why? I, I actually made the decision because uh, even though people criticized me in Turkey because of that, because there was this new Kafkaesque law that uh, if you're making a film about these issues, you are supporting terrorists and terrorism, you know. And, and at that time we showed the film in Locarno and it was going really well. And we were showing it in many countries. I said, okay, I'm going to show this film in Turkey and, you know, 25 people will watch it. And then I will be in trouble because some guy will come and uh, shoot, you know, I will end up in court and facing four years. So I was completely being pragmatic. And, um, but I, mostly I was trying to protect my crew, my editor, my DOP, uh, people I take uh, found footage, and all these independent filmmakers and um, news uh, people. I want, to, I, 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 I want to protect them. And um, it's not screened in Turkey, but then again, we 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 share the links of the people with, yeah. with, with the same you know you know, so they know, but um, I don't like to victimize myself about these issues. It was my decision to not to show it, not only to do it for the government, but also for the conservative left wing people. They also. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, in, I think in every country there are some uh, left wing movements. They are way conservative than the right wing, especially uh, towards minorities or you know, uh, you know, gays of this and that. And uh, it was a reaction to everybody, and um, that's why I didn't show it. Can you also relate to the, you use some literary, yeah. yeah, can you talk about that? I want to make a really feminine film because the, the war, the idea of war or, you know, practice of war is very male dominated, you know, and universally male dominated. So uh, as a reaction to that, I want to, when we were editing the film, when, uh, when we were experimenting with the scenes, how we, gonna, we, we were trying to make a decision how the scenes gonna flow and stuff like that. I, I, uh, I was uh, thinking that, okay, let's make a feminine film as I contrast what we are showing in the film. Uh, and, and my main protagonist, uh, Ebru, she's a brilliant uh, writer. She published a couple of novels but she also studied opera, so she also acted in theater and some popular TV series. So I thought that, you know, I could, I could use her as a real person because she knows what's going on there. She could speak Kurdish in five different tongue, you know. She's, uh, she has this immense knowledge about uh, what's going on in the region. And we also, uh, use some cut-up techniques while we were writing uh, the voiceovers. We, I wrote it with her. I used some of the sentences from her novels, and uh, and um, it, when that doesn't work, we were uh, we we sit down and rewrite together. So so her existence were was really important for the film, and. Uh, not only that she's a beautiful woman and you know she's really she has got this big eyes really expressive face but she also she's she's in the middle of everything i mean uh, 
her father is in prison now because he he is you know uh, he because of political reasons. So to all these elements, uh, uh, it, this is her real life. So I used it in the film, and um, with, with the with, with the appearance of her, I think I somehow I felt like I succeed to make it, even with all these contrasts. I succeed to make a feminine film. Well, I think now we can screen the part of the meteors and screen and yeah. then talk a little bit about that. Uh, this is actually captured by, by com completely. As I, as I said in the beginning, I believe in accident. This is this happened uh, completely by accident. And uh, while Turkish army was attacking Kurdish uh, neighborhoods, meteors started to fall, and their sound was so immense and big that both sides think that okay, some you know other. You know, you know, some, some, you know there, there is war happening. Some, so they stopped uh, to find out uh, who's attacking, attacking them. And uh, uh, this, is the, this is that moment in which you're going to see. Uh, I shot some of the images, but I also used some of the um, images of Russian TV crew from Syrian side of the border, which they also accidentally shot. And that's the se sequence. Thank 
Before, before you say something, can I add something? Before the scene, like in the middle of the film, you have another scene where we see only flashes of light, mm -hmm. and those flashes of light are from shotguns, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. So, and in this scene, also at the same time, you, you have people screaming, and when people start screaming, you don't know that they are having fun. So there is this contradiction between also the beautiful images of the meteors and the beautiful images of the lights of the shotguns. So it's beautiful at the same time, very... Um, yeah. yeah, yeah the, 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 this is how we... I mean, the, the editing part is very important for me and I usually experiment a lot if I have time. I, I try to create time in able to experiment with that. And um, uh, I always think that whenever I saw a film, is a certain images or sounds stays with me after films ended, and it's nothing to do with the content of the film usually, uh, but those images or sounds always haunts me after I uh, even months after. So, also with this scene, we try to create that there is this, you know, I mean, there is a civil war going on. But the Luna parks are, you know, theme parks are still open. So people are having fun. Are they having fun? Or they, are they get, being killed? So they could get killed but by some sniper. So you never know, you know. So it's, it's, so it's, it's a gray area. And it actually happened while we were um, shooting it. And the children were sc screaming so badly that I thought that some children got shot. So... Uh, it's always uh, in uh, between the, this gray area. And um, uh, also the sounds, uh, the sounds, b b b b this is exactly what people hear when, when it happens. Uh, we are calling them sonic booms. Of course, we had to go and create, recreate all of these sounds because we hadn't got any clean sounds at that time. And um, it's an important, moment in the film because this is uh, how, as I call, Pagangas stopped the war for a while. And funnily enough, maybe you read it in the news because it was a big issue with Donald Trump also, Turkish army invade uh, Kurdistan again in the south, uh, uh, northern Iraq. And after 15 days later, yeah, exactly, a month ago, um, uh, Meteor started to fall again, and, uh, and it was really funny to see that, and, uh, because it was in the news, and uh, then uh, on that particular night, uh, Turkish and Russian forces had to stop, uh, because they were both intervening, and, and, and it was it's, it, somehow, I, I don't know what imitates what, but it was really funny to see that, that in the same region there was an attack again and then meteors appeared and, uh, you know. Okay, more questions?
Yes, they have. But there's a, there's also, you know, since it's being a dirty war, it's not a, you know, it's a very dirty war on both sides. So, so many, so many images being used as a propaganda on both sides, you know, equally, actually. And uh, with the um, power of the, you know, uh, social media or all these applications and everything, it's easy to use. So people are using it as a propaganda. For instance, one month ago, there was an attack on, on a hospital and that there was a big trauma on social media. Then people find out that it, these are like two years old images. It's not new at all. So there's always this disinformation. And um, so that's why people react to, to that a lot because there's a lot of um, propaganda films going on between both sides. And, and with this project, I try to, of course I'm taking Kurdish sides because this is, uh, you know, but at the same time, I try to be neutral about the subject. Uh, I put this distance uh, because not only that um, you, uh, you should make something you know, strong, at least politically, but also I don't, want to, I don't want anyone to interfere. I don't need to justify myself politically in able to make a you know, good film, I must say. Uh, but as I told you before, in a, in a country is like ours, uh, for instance, I was talking with an Italian friend and he told me the same thing about left wing in Italy. Sometimes I mean, you had a reaction from liberal, you know, parts. Sometimes, uh, you, know, you know, right wing or conservative people, you know, they just watch and, you know, I mean, no comment, but the left wing sometimes has this reaction. So there is no uh, obvious, uh, you know, uh, contrast between the two. I mean, um, there is one thing. Kurdish wants their own land and their own, you know, federation. And they already start building that. And uh, for both sides, I mean, right wing, left wing, or whatever, you know, anarchists, people have reaction to that because they are growing up seeing this map of their country. So if that map is changed, people, you know, people feel trauma, you know. They don't want it to change. So not showing the film in Turkey actually protect me from a lot of bullshit. So and uh, so that I could focus uh, on the next film, and as I said, I don't feel like uh, I'm an activist, and uh, I don't need to answer every question. And um, I just saw something really horrible and uh, nasty and violent, and uh, this film was a reaction to that. If I work in a different kind of art discipline. I probably do, were, were gonna go that and do that, or write something, or release the song on Spotify, or whatever. In this case, we somehow managed to make this film, and uh, we we managed to open in Locarno. That's how it met with uh, people. Uh, but other than that, when I was showing to Locarno, I, I told them that I was not planning to release it in a festival. I was gonna put on. Vimeo or YouTube or something, and um, then that, that plans has been changed, of course. Um, can you tell us a little bit also about your influences, what kind of cinema you like, and if you can relate that also with your film seems to, and you can agree or not with this, but seems to fit in a recent trend of mixing documentary with fiction, so a lot of films have done that in the past years. Can you talk a little bit about that and what inspires you? Uh, it changes, I think, for like all of us, it, it's, uh, it changes all the time. But while I was uh, making um, Meteors, 
And Gugliabani, in that case, I was watching a lot of Roberto Rossellini. Not that there is a, there is a similarity, but you know, it's a completely different kind of uh, concept he is. But the, the way he approaches uh, his subjects, and I really love his, even the late period of him, which people doesn't like usually. I, I mean, I was watching a lot of Rossellini, and, um, and Werner Herzog, I was watching a lot of his old shorts from the 60s. I think he invent, invented the idea of creative documentary. There is not such thing exist back then. Mm -hmm. And he, I think he, he invented with Fata Morgana, which is a masterpiece, if you ask me. And, uh, and also with some writers, some you know, write with literature, mostly music. And uh, I don't get inspired a lot of from uh, filmmakers, actually. And, and the inspiration mostly comes from ridiculous places, you know? Yeah. And uh, because I always had that, this fear that, uh, okay, if you're gonna copy something, just don't do that. You know, you go and do something else. And uh, so I try to not to get too inspired with particular uh, filmmaker or period, I must say. And, uh, but um, I was listening a lot of Joy Division, which has nothing to do with the film. But there's this nihilist aspect, of course, mm -hmm. which you could see it in the film. It's a dark film. You should watch it in the dark and, you know, there are, there are guitars. I was listening a lot of Mogwai, which I ended up using in the film and uh, stuff like that. More questions? Everybody's shy today. That's a difficult question to answer. Um, I don't know. I just had this, you know, I deal and I read a lot of um, uh, about psychedelia and occult. And my new film is much more like a fiction film also based on that. Also, as you could see with Gulyabani, the main character, she's a clairvoyant. She could move, you know, things. She could see future, and I believe in that, in principle, of course. And, um, and when I made this film, I saw that this contrast could work, actually could really work within each other, not only with my films, but also with other people's films, too. Uh, uh, I remember watching latest Bruno Dumont film and there's this really funny scene that uh, completely funny and banal uh, thing was happening in the church, but uh, then you had this sense of spirituality, you know? So all these, um, I mean, I'm coming from a country which people usually make films in a very, you know, they are really orthodox. Uh, about what they do, and I don't like that. I mean, uh, uh, I remember first time I had a short film, and I went to Doc Leipzig, and it was a horrible experience for me. And all these people are talking about reality. I'm completely bored about that. I cannot see any creativity with the purest documentary filmmaker, filmmaking. I mean, of course, I like to watch a documentary with talking guests if the, if the subject is interests me, you know. I'm not against that. But in my case, I like to mix things. I'm also coming from a country which uh, most people voting for right-wing parties and we had this repressive regime. And I always believe that, not only in my country, but also when you look at that now, and on, in the East Europe or Russia, for instance, 
that th there is this always a relationship between repressive regimes and the supernatural, because they think that they are chosen. They, uh, they, uh, they, someone put them over there by some higher. There is some higher meaning behind that, which is completely ridiculous. But there is a there is a relationship between the occult and repressive regimes, and both films actually about repressive regimes and, 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 uh, and about people who crush by that. So that's why I'm using these elements, I, I, I think. I don't know. I think also, the um, Gulab, any, we can talk a little bit about that film. And uh, relating to Pedro's question, you, the kind the experimentation that you do in the film also deals with these different kind of realities or levels or uh, layers. And can can you talk about this uh, push that you have? In, uh, mostly in Gilda Abani, it seems it it really seems that you are experimenting with things, with uh, just just positions, with editing, with etc. Um, this idea actually came with an obstacle that I know the character. She was uh, adopted by my grandfather, and we didn't know about her background at all. We only know that uh, she was a nurse, and um, you know, and um, we find out about her later. And uh, the, when I, uh, she, she has this illness and the, the situation was getting worse. And I told her that, oh, okay, I'm gonna make a film about you. And, and uh, the, she, she told me that, okay, you could do that, but the uh, uh, only way you could do that is you, you will not show my face in the film or you will, you will not show me. So this obstacle actually worked for me that I, then I sit down, okay, how can you make a film about someone without showing that particular person? And then I focused on uh, how this person sees things because she's, she's, she's a clairvoyant, she, cause she has this, uh, you know, uh, powers that she could uh, see future and actually in the film she could see future and the past at the same time. And I always, um, uh, uh, as like a, some still from Exorcist film, I always um, uh, imagine uh, her, you know, she's levitating while, uh, while she was in the hospital, uh, which I didn't use that image in the film, but it, I used it in the, as a painting in the poster. So the, this, experimentation came with the with the subject itself and uh, you cannot um, approach uh, this kind of subject in a you know Netflix style I must say you know so uh, I also as I told you at the beginning I had a lot of experimentation with the film I shot a lot of useless test footage or some pinhole camera stuff uh, because I, I was trying to learn how uh, eight millimeter could work. So I was using 500, 200, you know, uh, all, all these kind of stocks. And, uh, and we use a lot of that in the film. So mostly they are accidents and, uh, uh, or mistakes, I might say. Uh, some, but somehow it worked. But there's also one sequence in the film which which is a is a orphan footage discovered by a Greek anarchist film collective. Uh, they found this film reel in Istanbul on the street uh, in the bazaar. So they went back to uh, Greece and uh, and give it to lab. And 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 what you what come up is this family uh, from the late 70s, maybe it's late 60s. You cannot tell. And there is something go going on within the family that father is a bit too creepy and bossy, and then the woman, uh, you know, she is uh, she's too straight, and the, and the children. There's something sinister going on within the family. So when I watched that, I asked them to use it, and uh, because it, since we don't know who they are, since it's been already orphaned, it very much fit with the spirit of the film. So. All these ideas came from the 
you know, from her powers. And, uh, and uh, since uh, the period she lives, there was, it's, not a, it's not a HD period, it's a very analog period. And, and even, you don't need too much money. Right now it's a niche thing, but at that time everybody has their own eight meter millimeter in their, in their homes. And it was, it was cheap and easy to produce. So there's a lot of home movies like that. And um, yes, I used all of these uh, elements in the film. Maybe we can see now the, the part the that bit. we selected. Yeah, sure. <coughs> In this sequence, she's, uh, she's actually dreaming about her son in the, on the beach. Funny, funniest part is that uh, with this film we were in competition at some documentary film festivals, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, it's actually a documentary. It's based on a real person, but uh, the, the uh, approach is not uh, a documentary at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's between things, I guess. 
Mm -hmm. And in this part, it's all found footage, or you also have parts that you mm. film yourself? No, no. There's um, there's a couple of shots which made uh, with uh, pinhole cameras, mm -hmm. which you basically put some light and you capture the images uh, after that. And uh, and um, but but the the majority of found footage footage are used in the film, which you see the family. Uh, apart from that, it's all uh, coming. Some of the images I shot for, for this film, it's actually shot in 2009. So we used, uh, not from the hard disk, from original uh, telecine tapes. And um, yeah. we go so back to that. It's almost some, uh, very artisanal, the, the making of the film, with the pinhole and... Yes, and it was it. very physical. Yeah. And uh, because... Even though I like uh, new formats and HD, I, I, I started to, as a filmmaker. I started to think it became too easy, you know, for all of us. Not only for doing it, but also consuming, consuming it, you know, and all these, um, you know, polished images. So um, yes, and uh, it's a physical film. It's also physically exhausting film. The sounds you hear, we actually made it. There's this brilliant British sound collective in the, in the UK, in London, and we create these sounds with Chinese walks and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, throwing some water on them and uh, all these, uh, you know, so they, they, are not also, they are also analog and mm -hmm. uh, we didn't uh, create them um, digitally. Mm -hmm. can, can you say the name of the British collective? Do you remember? Uh, I, will, I, will, I will give okay. them their EP. They had really long names with the, with the some, you know, really, really difficult. But it's on, um, yeah, it's on the internet. We, we credit them everywhere. And uh, uh, they gave me their recordings. I went to see them doing this uh, stuff with the Chinese, Chinese walks. And I asked them, that, oh, okay, if I, I, can I use it? They said no. Then I showed them the film and I said, okay, yes. And, uh, and they are funny people. I, I actually invite them over for premiere. I said, why? We already seen it and you know. <laughs> but um, somehow it fit with the film and um, I used it. <laughs> More comments and questions? I usually don't ask questions in situations like this, yeah, okay. too. I always, you know, <laughs> sit and watch. And <laughs> no, no more questions. By the way, this film will be screened tomorrow, I guess. Yeah. So if you have time and if you don't watch it yet, and come and join us. Yeah, it will be at 4.30. 4.30. At Rivoli, yeah. The film will be screened, but it's screened in, on digital. Actually, it's not. You don't yeah, have a there print. There's no color. way to do that. Uh, I mean, because even though I mean, yeah, there. No, I mean, it's in almost in many places. Apart from uh, some major festivals, it's impossible to show uh, from a uh, print these days. No. Also, uh, it was a bit impossible for us uh, to do that. Because the we use 16 millimeter, 8 millimeter, blowing up and down all these images, it was a hell. So we at the end we sit down and uh, edit it uh, digitally. Before we came in, we were talking a little bit about how to, why make films, uh, how to make films. We have a, an audience of potential filmmakers, so. The question, can you give something of advice or something you want to say to them? I mean, I don't think, I mean, they need anyone's advice. But um, what I tried to say here today that usually uh, ideas uh, came uh, ridiculously. They don't, doesn't, it, they don't make sense at all at the beginning. And then uh, you dig deeper and you explore that particular idea and it could turn into a film. And uh, I was, you know, right now I'm getting older and, uh, and I'm seeing myself in the, 
in the past, especially at the film school, I think I was much more conservative about the idea of making a film. For me, it was a process. It was, it was something you earn. Now I don't believe that anyone can do. And, um, and everything could be a film if you are smart enough or if you work out. There's this suffering process which you cannot deny. I mean, there's this, I mean, suffering comes with the, you know, this is, this is the part of the physical aspect of the filmmaking, I think. I mean, you cannot sit down in a studio and waiting things to happen. Especially with, I don't know uh, if, if uh, some, some of you are interested in with the documentary filmmaking, which is, which is the, uh, rich, the most rich language in cinema exists right now. And uh, uh, there's a physical side to it. And uh, of course, there's this always intellectual side. There's, there's always layers and layers, you know, how to bring up, how do you going to bring up the subject? But as much you analyze, then you ruin the film. Uh, I mean, just try to analyze how you're going to do it. And, um, and if people, maybe my the only advice could be that if, uh, people could tell you that, okay, this idea is ridiculous and you cannot make a film out of this particular idea. Just don't believe them. You know, uh, I mean, nobody believes, I mean, yeah. I mean, as I get older, I'm, I'm a bit too hesitant to talk about uh, this stuff because uh, I'm learning a lot with every film. I mean, I learned a lot with Meteors. Uh, uh, I learned a lot with Gulyabani, also technically. I also saw all many weakest points. Uh, and uh, I also um, see the importance of experimentation. Don't get me wrong, you don't need to make uh, experimental cinema. You could uh, experiment with the idea of a drama too. and. Uh, but uh, you know, this could be the only advice I could give it to just uh, just just be honest to your material. Yeah. Then things will happen, I guess. I don't think I understand your question, but as far as I understand, I will try to answer it. Can you? But I had a special interest because my next film will be, will be also the uh, as, a, as a discipline based on 
Turkish occult and uh, Middle Eastern occult and uh, the way we, we had this, um, I won't go into details, but we have this story which we are using a lot of Byzantine occult, pre-Byzantine occult, uh, or you know Ottoman occult, and and it, this subject interests me a lot because you could see the traces of the society at that time and beliefs. Um, I'm not a yeah I'm not, I'm an agnostic person, and my ag agnostic side the same goes with, with the occult too, so I'm very distant to that. But I, 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 um, what people find spiritual always interests me as a filmmaker. You know, if, if, if a group of people find something, this chair, spiritual, and then I started to look at that chair, actually. It, uh, uh, what interests me is that people's relationship with that particular subject, uh, with their beliefs, for instance. I mean, how come you had uh, this strange abusive relationship with a little girl just because you believe that she could see the future you know that kind of stuff and um so i have no personal connection to that i have you know i'm not uh, sitting down and reading aleister crowley or something you know but what interests me in spirituality that people's relationship with their you know with the, with the subject itself and uh, and um, yeah. Okay, so just to remember, tomorrow we will have a screening of Jody Mac's film, followed by a Q&A with Jody Mac, and on Friday, a workshop with Jody Mac. So thank you very much, Gurken, for being here. Thank you for with having us. With us.